Hey everybody, welcome to The Bottom Line. Michael Noland here. Tonight we're gonna be covering the Beatles' second masterpiece, Rubber Soul. Okay, so with Rubber Soul, we see the Beatles settle firmly into what most people would consider their mid-period, a period that started with their prior album, Help. But first, a quick shout out to all of our viewers. A big thank you for sharing our videos. Now, like my prior videos on the Beatles albums, I always start with any singles that were recorded during the process of recording that album. And of course, the single recorded and presented to the world here is the double A side, Day Tripper, and We Can Work It Out. Now, by John's recollection, it was heavily his song. But on We Can Work It Out, both writers are clearly present, with Paul providing the positive, upbeat lyrics of the verses and the chorus, and John providing the more reflective lyrics in the middle eight. But you know, I just recently found out that it was George Harrison's idea to slip that middle eight into waltz time or three-quarter time. Now, it's also interesting with these releases. In Britain, Day Tripper was the clear winner and by a ratio of two to one. But over in the United States, by the same ratio, We Can Work It Out was the clear winner. So the first track off the bat is Drive My Car. Now, although the origin of this song was from Paul, this is heavily co-written by John as well. Of course, here we see John's influence where there is a role reversal between the man and the woman in the song. Now, of course, the instrumentation so far on the album remains pretty consistent with what the Beatles could do live. But the instrumentation is also more inventive in this song. Now, there was some debate as to who played piano on this, suggesting that maybe it was Paul, but studio records indicate that it was probably John, and I love the piano playing on this song. All right, so the next song on the album is, of course, Norwegian Wood, and we've got to talk about the instrumentation right off the bat. That, of course, is the addition of the sitar played by, of course, George Harrison. Now this song is John's attempt to write about an illicit affair he was having with a female reporter at the time. But it was Paul's idea to have the person within the song burn the woman's apartment down at the end. And of course, this provided the observant listener with a little bit of Beatle dark humor. Now it's interesting, Norman Smith, the Beatles recording engineer at this time, said he had a hell of a time getting that sitar recorded. Either it wouldn't show up on the dial or it would bury the dial. But in the end, he did a fine job and the recording is very clean. Of course, next up is Paul's magnificent You Won't See Me, a song based on his relationship with actress Jane Nasher, one of two on the album. But you know, right here is where we really got to talk about Paul's bass playing, not only on this song, but on the entire album for the most part. Here we see him taking on a melodic approach, and really, this is where we see Paul McCartney as the king pop rock bassist of his time. Now it's also important to listen to Ringo's drums. Not only are their triplets played there, but they sound more powerful. Again, engineer Norman Smith to the rescue, this time using a Fairchild limiter on Ringo's drums. Jeff Emmerich was known to use the Fairchild limiter all the time. It was part of his sound. But here we see Norman Smith beat him to the punch, at least on one song. Up next, John's magnificent, and I don't use that word lightly, Nowhere Man. Now John recalls that he was desperately trying to write a song one evening, totally giving up finally, thinking he was nothing. He went to bed thinking he was a real Nowhere Man. Once he had that, he said the song came in one gulp. Now the song has traditional instrumentation, but that's where traditional ends with this song. First of all, the song starts off with a cappella three-part harmony. But not only that, the guitars were recorded with high treble gain that only adds sparkle to a song that more than hints of the psychedelic sound the Beatles would later explore. Okay, next up is George Harrison's first of two songs on this album, 
think for yourself. Here, the Beatles start getting a bit exotic with the instruments they're playing. John providing keyboards on an electric Vox organ, and Paul providing bass guitar here, but then overdubbing on top of that original bass, a fuzz box bass line. Here Paul said he was trying to achieve a Motown type of sound and he certainly does on this song. George Harrison's writing has matured quite a bit on this song, his lyrics reflective as always. Next up of course is the song The Word and this is originally John's song. A lot of co-composition though with this song as well with Paul. Here George Martin plays a harmonium an instrument that he would continue to provide especially heavily on Sgt. Pepper's. Also here we see Paul playing piano on the basic rhythm track on this song and of course on the song Michelle. For the first time Paul overdubs his bass as an overdub instrument, something that he would do increasingly up to and through Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Now the song was originally, as I said, a John song, and this is the first song where he talks about love as a universal love, more or less, rather than romantic love. And of course, he would continue to explore that aspect of love in further compositions. Next up, Paul's wonderful Michelle. He had written this many years earlier. He used to perform it at parties, trying to pretend he was a Frenchman to impress the girls. It was at this point that John suggested he dust off that song and provide some lyrics for it because the melody wasn't bad. Here, of course, is the second time that Paul overdubs his bass and he really goes to town on this in a very subtle way. Of course, Paul provides French words in this song. Paul went to a friend who spoke French and she suggested certain lines and between the two of them, they worked out the final lines. Now the next song on the album, of course, is What Goes On, and it's probably the weakest song on the album, but you know I've come to appreciate this song over the years, and that's because it sounds very similar to some of the country western covers that Ringo had recorded previously, but this time it was written by John and Paul, oh yeah, and Ringo. Now in later interviews, Ringo admitted that he probably provided about five words for the song, helped with the rhythm, and that was about it. But you know, as a Carl Perkins-like type of tune, it's not bad. Up next, the song Girl by John Lennon. This song is more of a song about a dream girl by John Lennon. And in the song, you hear heavy, sensual breathing before he pronounces the word girl. Now it's interesting here. In the background, the harmonies aren't dit, 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 dit. Cover your ears, children, because the word they used was tit. Now evidently the story was that George Martin asked them, are you singing dit, 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 or tit, tit, tit? And the Beatles replied very quickly, oh no, it's dit, 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 George. Next up, of course, is Paul McCartney's I'm Looking Through You, the second song on the album that provides us with a bit of insight to his relationship with the actress Jane Asher. Of course, in this song, we hear hand slaps, not for the first time on the album, a trick that Paul would use throughout his entire career to this very day. All right, next up is John Lennon's song, In My Life. Now, John claimed total authorship of this song. Paul thoroughly disagreed with him, saying that John had written the lyrics prior and that he, Paul, had provided the melody and chord structures for the song. But you know, a careful listen to this song tells me that John Lennon certainly had a hand in the melody because there are far too many John Lennon notes in this song for him to have not had at least partial participation in developing the melody of this song. Of course, after this is the song Wait. Now it's interesting. Wait was recorded during the Help album and was almost included on there. Now generally, this song is seen as an equal composition between John and Paul. However, Paul remembers writing it in the Bahamas and doesn't remember John participating in the writing of it. Of course, next up is George Harrison's 
if I needed someone. Here we see George continually progress as a songwriter. George Martin provides, not for the last time, harmonium on this song, giving it just a touch more class. On the next album, George Harrison's composition play a major role, and he actually gets three cuts on that album. Of course, the album concludes with John Lennon's Run For Your Life, a song greatly maligned from both outside the Beatle camp and those inside the Beatle camp in later years. No, I think this song is not only authentic, but it also expresses John Lennon's headspace at the time, and I love this song. This is one of my favorite songs on the album. Mm -hmm. 